service meeting shortly. Good morning. Good morning. It's a joy to gather together as the people of God. Welcome to our time of worship this morning. Uh, thank you for braving the cold this morning and joining us. I know it's a chilly one out there. I uh, have a few announcements as we begin the service. First of all, don't, uh, don't forget to notice the supplemental uh, update to the bulletin for the announcements since uh, we, we did not have worship last Sunday. Most of our service is modeled from that. Um, we are going to be having a consistory meeting after church uh, today, and uh, we have two member or two individuals who have expressed a willingness to fill the uh, vacancies that were in the last year, and that's Brian Hoffines and Randy Barnes. So we'll be doing an installation for them soon, but we'll be voting on that uh, in our consistory meeting following church. Also, uh, the soup is all ready. If you purchase soup from the Youth Fellowship Soup Sale, that's back in the kitchen. I think the one by the back door is the chicken corn soup, and the other soup is by the in the closer uh, refrigerator. And there are extras that are available if you did not get to purchase one and would like some soup, please see Tina after the service. Um, the cost of flowers has increased slightly, so if you are going to be buying, uh, purchasing uh, flowers for Sunday morning in memory, uh, it's gonna be $15 for one and 30 for two. Uh, also, this upcoming Tuesday, we're still going to be on break with prayer breakfast, kind of waiting until things calm down a bit there. Uh, however, we are resuming our Bible study on Zoom. That's Tuesday night at 7 on Zoom, and that will be on the book of Exodus. 
So I invite you to join as we start studying that together. I believe that's all of the announcements that I have. Are there any other announcements to share this morning? And let's prepare our hearts to worship as we listen to the prelude. Please now join in our invocation hymn, We Have Come at Christ's Own Bidding, number 245, verse 1. Father, we thank you that you have gathered us in this place. We ask that as we are together to worship you, that you will enable us to worship you in spirit and in truth. Help us cast aside all distractions, all burdens, everything that would hold us back this morning, and let us worship you, Lord, with whole and joyous hearts. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please now join in our call to worship, which is taken from the 29th Psalm. And please respond in the bolded print. Ascribe to the Lord, you heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The, vo- the God of glory thunders. The Lord thunders over the mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is majestic. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks in pieces the cedars of Lebanon. 
the voice of the Lord twists the oaks and strips the forest bare. And all the all cry, Glory. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord is enthroned as king forever. The Lord gives strength to his people. The Lord blesses his people with peace. Amen. Please join in our opening hymn, number 66, To God Be the Glory. It's our desire that we would live lives of praise and glory to God. That in all that we would do, that we would be making a life uh, that is known and glorifying to God, visible to all who are around us. And yet at times we also know that we fall short. We don't live how God would want us to do, live the way that God would want us to be, nor do we do what even our heart would desire to do. So I invite you now to join with me with repentant hearts to join in our unison prayer of confession as it's printed in our bulletin. Let's pray. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your name. Amen. Let us now take a moment to silently confess our sins to God.
Having now silently confessed our sins to God and offered the prayers of our lips as well, let us hear the good news, that we have a God who is good and faithful in keeping the promises made to us, that we are extended grace, love, mercy, and forgiveness. And indeed, it is in the name of Jesus Christ that our sins are forgiven. Amen. Our first scripture reading this morning is taken from the book of Luke, chapter 3, verses 15 through 22. If you'd like to follow along in your pew Bible, that's on page 1,182. Luke 3, beginning at verse 15. Now as the people were in expectation and all reasoned in their hearts about John, whether he was the Christ or not, John answered, saying to all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I is coming, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather the wheat into his barn but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. And with many other exhortations he preached to the people. But Herod the Tetrarch, being rebuked by him concerning Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, and for all the evils which Herod had done, also added this above all, that he shut John up in prison. When all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized. And while he prayed, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him, and a voice came from heaven which said, You are my beloved Son, in you I am well pleased. Our next scripture reading is from the book of Acts, chapter 8, verses 9 through 17. That's on page 1262. In your pew Bible. Acts chapter 8, beginning at verse 9. But there was a certain man called Simon who previously practiced sorcery in the city and astonished the people of Samaria, claiming that he was someone great, to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. And they heeded him because he had astonished them with his sorceries for a long time. But when they believed Philip as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. And Simon himself also believed. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed, seeing the miracles and signs which were done. Now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet he had fallen upon none of them, they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid hands on them and received the Holy Spirit. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. I want to invite our young folks to come forward for our question and answer time this morning. Good morning. It's good to be together again after missing last week. I was a little worried looking at the uh, forecast about snow. You guys probably don't worry. Well, do you know out there, I know, based for Spring Grove, that you don't get snow days anymore, right? You got to do virtual work. What is that? Remember when we had snow days, the good days when we were young and you would hope that snow was coming because you knew you could have a day off, you could go sledding, you could make a snowman, you could play around in the snow, you could sleep in, or you could do extra chores that your parents had for you. Uh, you know, not anymore, now you get virtual learning days. That's, uh, I think, less exciting for me than a snow day. 
I don't know how you felt when we didn't have church. Maybe you're like, yes, a snow day from church. I don't have to come on Sunday. Um, you know, I, there's probably a little part of all of us that feel that, right? Maybe just a little part. I mean, definitely, you know, it is nice to have an extra morning where we can sleep in and, and maybe get some things done. We don't have to run around as much. Uh, I'm not going to ask if you were excited about missing church. My heart can't take the answer to that. Um, but, you know, I, I, as, as I was thinking about it, uh, you know, one of the things that I think was really important for me to think about last Sunday as we work together in person is what is church? So what's church? Yeah. A place where you get to learn about God. A place where you get to learn about God. That's a really good answer. Um, but I have to tell you, that's not, that's not the answer I was hoping for. But, but I think most of us think about it that way. It's a place where we get together and learn about God. It's kind of like a school for God, right? But, but when the Bible talks about the church, the Bible talks about something different. Any other thoughts about what the church is? You know, William's answer makes a lot of sense. Because what, what, what did we think this morning? Oh, I need to go to church, right? Church is a place. That we go to. Last week we we didn't have church. It's a it's a service that we have. But when the Bible talks about the church, it's not talking about a place that we go on Sunday morning. Well, they would have got together on Sunday morning anyways. They would have got together on Saturdays because they were Jewish until like later on. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. Um, <clears throat> church, it's us. This building is nice. But this building is not the house of God. Um, you know, if, if something terrible happened and there was a fire or a tornado and the building was gone, we could still have church that very next week. We wouldn't meet in this nice, nice building. We'd have to meet somewhere else. Maybe we'd go meet in the fire hall. Maybe we would now, talk to the Lutheran church and be over there. Uh, but we could still be a church. How would that be if we didn't have the building? It's because we're the church. We get this promise from Jesus that where two or three are gathered, that he's with us. The church is about being together as the people of God and living out the living out the call that God has put on all of our lives. So even when we don't meet for a Sunday morning worship service, we're still the church. You know, and, and I think this is something that a lot of people were challenged with. Do you remember you know, not long ago when we were all at home for a long time? It's like, well, what's the church now? And it's different. And I think that it's important for us to learn that important lesson. You know, it, it's hard. We're still going to keep on calling this church, that we go to church. Let's meet at church for this activity. You know, I'm going to invite you to my church. Um, but I never want you to just think about church as a place where we go. Because church is us. And whether or not we have a building, we're still the body of believers. In fact, uh, the building is not God's special dwelling place. Because God's going somewhere else. And we're talking about this today in the sermon with the baptism of Jesus. Do you know where God dwells now? On the earth, that is. I mean, you know, God's everywhere. God's in heaven. Jesus, right? And God the Father in heaven. But, but where does God dwell for us today? Anybody know? Oh, I saw it. God dwells in us. Each and every one of us when we celebrate baptism, but it's not like baptism is a magic act that makes it happen, uh, God, God dwells in us. And, and I think that this is something that's really important because, because being the church is about bringing the presence of God into this world. And we can do that whether we're in a building together, whether we're going to school, we're at our homes, or hanging out with our friends, or at our jobs, or volunteering.
volunteering somewhere or driving down the road or whatever we're doing, we can bring the presence of God wherever we are. And that's what we're called to do as a church. And I want to encourage all of you to really let that sink in. Because for me, I feel like that, well, that makes me feel special from God. Because God doesn't just say, like, look, you want to meet up with me, go to this special building, and I'll meet you there. God says, no, you are worth being with. I love you so much. I care about you so much. I see so much in you that I will always be with you. And that promise for us is forever. The Bible talks about the Holy Spirit in us being a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. The work that God starts in our life and continues in the new life that we'll have, the Lord Jesus, it's it's a continuous life. In the presence of God, so, I want to encourage you with that. And by the way, I do also want you to know that like, if you're studying the Old Testament and you get the idea that the church is a place uh, where we go, that makes a lot of sense in the Old Testament because the temple was a special dwelling place for God. And there was a specific place in the temple, the most holy place, that only one person could go in once a year. They had a rope tied to their ankle in case they got a little too much of God and then they died and you had to pull them, their body out of there. I'm not making this up. Pretty gnarly, you know, I would not be excited to go in there knowing that here's the rope on my ankle in case I drop dead. Um, but then, you know, when Jesus died, there's this picture, one of the Gospels, I can't remember which one, and where, the, where the, the curtain that separates that most holy place where God dwells, rips, all of a sudden, the presence of God is no longer limited in a certain little place. That's also what we we'll, we'll remember with Jesus, you know, God's dwelling among us. Okay, anyway. That's enough of this. So let me pray for us today. God, thank you so much that, um, yeah, we're here to worship you. But uh, but what makes us uh, fitting worship you here is not because we have a nice building. Uh, It's not because because of anything like that, but it's because we are your people. And uh, wherever we're gathered together, you're present. And we know that you're in our hearts here in our lives. And so thank you, God, for your presence in us. And help us to always remember that that wherever we go, that we are ambassadors for you. That uh, whether we're at home, worshiping together uh, in our our church building, whether we are at school, wherever we are, that we are always with, uh, you are always with us. So thank you, God, for that. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Let's now continue worshiping God together in a time of prayer. Gracious God, we thank you that you are with us. We thank you that in you we have received grace and mercy and forgiveness. Even when we don't live in a way that's fitting of being uh, vessels of your presence, that uh, that you extend us grace. So thank you for that, Lord. And, and we pray as your people that as we're here to worship you today, that you will help us to do that in a way that is free from the burdens that we've come carrying. We know, Lord, that there are many things in our hearts and minds that weigh upon us this week. Um, things that we want to see your hand at work. And uh, Lord, we think of those who are hurting right now. We especially Lord, want to lift to you uh, Rose's friends, family, the uh, Donna Shives family who passed away unexpectedly, and we ask that your, uh, your peace and comfort would be with uh, her family, with Rose and, and others as they grieve. Lord, uh, we, we trust you 
that even when we say goodbye, that uh, again, you are a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. But uh, Lord, we, we feel the hurts of saying goodbye. So we ask your peace and comfort there. We continue to pray for Alice Ann for her recovery after her knee replacement and ask that your healing touch would be upon her uh, and strengthen her as uh, she continues in her time of uh, recovery and rehab. Lord, we lift up others who we know who are sick and feeling under the weather, uh, many who are on the path to recovery, but some who are still battling different illnesses. And Lord, we ask that you would uh, not just ease their symptoms, but bring healing and recovery, a, a sign of the healing that uh, you are yet to do for all of us. Lord, we know that the burdens that we face go beyond burdens of our bodies, uh, bodies that are not made to last. We also feel the burden that weighs on our hearts and minds, the, the stresses and strains of life. Uh, maybe it's anxiety about the um, upcoming storm and, and feeling worried about that. Maybe it's uh, that we just had a bad week and we were feeling down. Or maybe it's that uh, it's been a really tough season for us and we're missing family and friends who we'd normally get to be with. Lord, um, wherever we are, we ask that you would hear what's on our hearts and that we could give these to you. Lord, we know that as you came to this earth and lived like we lived and experienced what we experienced, that you empathize with us, with our very human condition. And so, Lord, we ask that knowing that you love and care for us, that you would meet us and that you would be at work in mighty ways. We also pray that uh, we would take seriously the call to be your church, your people, a worthy dwelling place for your spirit, and that as your church, we would go and live as you have called us to live, wherever we may be, whatever age we are, that we would always be reflecting you where we are. And so as your people, we now pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please now join in our sermon hymn number 682, The Fruit of Love.
Spirit, open our hearts and minds to your work. Grant me your words of life to proclaim. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to gather and enjoy your presence. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. How many of you remember your baptism? I imagine most of you were like me, baptized when you were infants. Maybe baptism is something that you're still looking forward to. I, I hope, uh, I believe this spring, Pentecost will be having a few baptisms in our church. Most of us don't recall our baptism um, because we've grown up in a tradition of uh, infant baptism, pedo baptism, uh, technically is the term for it. And I don't think that there's anything wrong with being baptized as an infant. Uh, I know that you might go and, and talk with other people from other traditions who say, nope, that baptism doesn't count. They are wrong. As your pastor, I will definitively say that. If anybody gives you trouble about that, uh, I am here to back you up on that point. Um, there is the other way of baptism, and something that's a little more similar to the account that we see in Luke chapter 3. I know that we've witnessed some baptisms here of a believer baptism, an adult baptism. Why does this all matter? Well, what's the point of baptism? Baptism is about identity. It's about belonging. Now, we all recognize here that you can be a part of this church, you can, this community of believers, you can be a part of the people of God without baptism. One of my favorite stories uh, to illustrate this, because I have heard some people say some ludicrously bad things about baptism, uh, I'll share a story with you. We were having a funeral at our church one day, and someone uh, came up to me and said, do you know if this person was baptized as an adult? And I said, it was my understanding, they were baptized as an infant. And this individual says to me, at a funeral, mind you, just after the service, well, it's too bad they're not in heaven now because they were not baptized as a believer. Now, if this was someone in our congregation, I probably would have taken a little more time for constructive instruction, but seeing as this is someone I knew I'd never see again in my life, I'm just like, okay, see you later. Um, I'm, you know me after all these years. I'm not one to jump into conflict or uh, you know, hot situations like that. But there's a part of me that can be a little bit of a smart aleck and wanted to say, think about Jesus on the cross. When he says to that individual next to him, the thief uh, crucified next to him, today you will be with me in paradise, was he baptized? No, right? Jesus didn't go, and I apologize, but this is, again, how my brain works. Jesus didn't look over at the guy and go, <laughs> you know, and try to baptize by projectile on him. Uh, you actually have, may have seen something early in the pandemic uh, going around of this picture of a priest with a super soaker, you know, the squirt gun, baptizing a baby at a distance. That's craziness. Anyways, like, that, that, Jesus did not have a super soaker, nor did he have holy uh, projectiles of spit to baptize this person. Um, it's, baptism is not about salvation. We can be saved without being baptized. That's what I would have pointed out to that person. I'm sure they would have been upset with me or thought, you can't say this kind of stuff as a pastor. And, you know, I, I don't know what I, why I didn't. Maybe I probably just missed a fun opportunity there to get someone aggravated at me. But um, baptism is about identity. It's, it's not about salvation, though we do have important salvation pictures tied to it. So what is the picture here? Uh, we have this beautiful picture here in the book of Luke about the baptism of Jesus. It's just a couple of verses. John is doing baptism in the wilderness, and people are coming, seeking baptism for the remission of sins. They are seeking baptism as a cleansing act. Like you might go in a bathtub after a long day working outside to clean the dirt off of you. That's the idea of baptism there. But John points to something more, doesn't he? Uh, I baptize you with water, cleansing. But one who is more powerful than I will come, whose straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Uh, fire, 
as our confirmands will remember this morning, is one of the present uh, images of God. Some of the presence of God, an image that we see at Pentecost, fire comes down, Holy Spirit. Uh, Fire is an image in the Bible. If you hear about fire, you should think, oh, the presence of God. Uh, Remember when God spoke out of a certain type of bush, what was What was the bush? The burning bush, right? Again, you know, fire, connection with God. Uh, We'll talk about this as we get into the story of uh, Exodus. God leads leads the Israelites through the wilderness at day by a pillar of smoke and at night by a pillar of fire. Similar, Similar thing. So the Bible, by the way, does these things where we should start picking up these little themes. When we hear about fire, okay, so... Jesus will baptize us not, I think, with literal fire, but the Holy Spirit in the presence of God. Um, And by the way, the fire of God does take great effects. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear the threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Uh, Remember how I said about the priest going into the presence of God. If the priest went in and was unworthy of being in the presence of God, That's why he had the rope tied to his ankle so they could pull him out. Um, I I think of the story that my dad told me when I said I was feeling called to go to seminary and to pastoral ministry when he told me about uh, Aaron's sons, uh, I believe it's Nadab and Abihu, who brought an improper sacrifice to God. And this is Old Testament, but you know, Old Testament's still our story. And when they bring the improper sacrifice to God, burned up in front of God. Even we see a glimpse of that in the New Testament when they, uh, was it Ananias and Sapphira, don't bring the whole offering and they lie in the presence. They drop. Um, The good news is that that seems to be the rare exception. Most of the time when we experience the fire of God, it is a good cleansing. God has cleansed our sins in a way that does not destroy us, but refines us. So we get this picture in Luke chapter 3 of the baptism of Jesus. This is just an observation about humanity, but I think most of humanity's problems go back to daddy issues. Uh, I I think most people, you know, you you just see some issue there with their father, there's something dysfunctional. I'm not saying it's 100%, but a lot of times there's unresolved issues with fathers that cause problems. So here, Luke chapter 3 says this, When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. No daddy issues there. Thank goodness. Or I guess we could say thank God for that. Um, Jesus has a model of a beautiful relationship with God. And there's a few things I want you to take away from this picture because as we think about the baptism of Jesus, we're not just thinking about his baptism, we're also thinking about our baptism. One of the beautiful, beautiful things about our story as the church, as the people of God, is that we are invited into a different reality, one that's different from our own. We are invited by Jesus when we pray to call God what? Father, right? We all have earthly fathers. Maybe they've been better. Maybe they've not been better. Maybe they've left us with issues. I don't know. But but we have a heavenly father. We have a God who we are invited to call Father. So we are invited into this new relationship with God. And there are a few things that are embodied in this picture. How many of you like pictures, like to visualize things? I really like pictures. One of my favorite pictures, and I'll, I'm happy to show it to you anytime, is, uh, is a piece of uh, Renaissance art by Caravaggio, the incredulity of uh, Thomas, doubting Thomas, poking his fingers in the side of Jesus. Uh, I just, I like that image because sometimes I feel like that doubting Thomas, who while I want to have faith, I also want to put my fingers in the side of Jesus to see for myself. I don't want to take someone else's word for it. I think that's why I like that psalm, taste and see that the Lord is good. It's experiential. I want to experience it. And from my place of experience and sharing with others. Most of you know that when 
I, in my preparation for my sermon, uh, I talked with my dad on Saturday nights. So during halftime of the game last night, my dad called me and uh, we were talking about this account and he said to me something that was curious. He, he said, for me, I picture this in my mind, these two verses, as a prayer to God. And why I think that's curious is because my dad hasn't seen anything in two decades. And the words he specifically used was of a picture. And he says, this picture is like a prayer for me. And I thought, oh, that's, that kind of stands out, right? I mean, a blind guy talking about picturing this account. And what does he picture? He pictures these few verses uh, that are seen in the different parallels of Jesus being baptized. So what do we see in this picture? So Jesus is being baptized. And baptism, first of all, is something that is shared for all of us. Um, it's an invitation to belong to the people of God. Uh, next time we gather together for our confirmation class, uh, the confirmands are very excited to talk about our topic in Genesis 17. We're going through the life of Abraham because we're going to talk about the covenant of circumcision. It used to be that, yeah, I, I know, I can see the smiles. Um, they're just really excited to talk about this. I mean, it's just one of the favorite topics, especially for teenagers um, <laughs> or for anybody. No one wants to talk about that. But, but that's what it meant to be a part of the people of God. In the Old Testament, you had to be circumcised. Well, that leaves out a large percentage of our population. Um, and, and, you know, especially for Abraham and Isaac, who are adults when this is all happening, or older, not babies who are not going to remember, that's a very traumatic thing. Here we have a new picture of what it means to be identified, to be brought into the people of God, and that is one of baptism both baptism of water and baptism of the Spirit. So this is the first picture here, that Jesus is being baptized, and it's a model for us. One of the things that I really love about God is that God meets us where we're at. That's what we were talking about with the story of Jesus, that when Jesus came, God could have just said, look, I'm God, I know everything. I know what it's like to be born. But I think all of us kind of like to know that we have someone who identifies with us, and so when Jesus was born, like we're born, when Jesus grew up, like we grew up, when Jesus died, like we will die, we have a God who identifies with us. And so here's Jesus being baptized too, even though, and we know from other gospel accounts and, and in here that John says, no, 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 I'm not worthy of this. You should baptize me. Jesus insists to be baptized. And so now that's the setting, Jesus being baptized in the water. And what's going on in this picture? As he was praying, heaven is opened. Heaven is the place where God dwells, where everything is as it should be. The place where we want to be. We want earth to be more like heaven, right? Because when we see things not the way that they should be, it's painful. Um, I got a call to help out yesterday from the funeral home that I assist with every so often. It was a funeral for a 38-year-old who died suddenly. You know, and what did I say to her family and friends? This is not how it's supposed to be. Parents are not supposed to say goodbye to a child. You're not supposed to be saying goodbye in the prime of life. Heaven isn't the place where things aren't as they should be. It's the place where things are just the way that they should be. So... Our prayer is, of course, that earth would be more like heaven. So heaven is opened. There's this break here into the world. And what comes from heaven? Two things. First of all, the Holy Spirit descending on Jesus in bodily form like a dove. Do you know that one of the early symbols of the church was the dove? Do we have some? We've got some doves here on our tree. You still see it today, but not with the same regularity. The early symbol wasn't the cross, because when everybody saw the cross, they thought of death. That's where bad people went to be executed. Uh, when the early church gathered, they saw the spirit, the dove, as the symbol of God's presence. And like I was talking about with our children's moment, uh, the, the spirit, the dove, doesn't just dwell in Jesus, but 
we have the good news that the Spirit indwells all of us. And by the way, the Spirit dwelling with us uh, means quite a bit. Uh, The Spirit works in us in powerful ways to make us more like Jesus. Think of the fruit of the Spirit, right? It's not the fruit of Pastor Paul who's worked really hard at being a good Christian. It's the fruit of the Spirit in me. We're all of you. We all have the, the, the same God working in us to make, it, make us more like Jesus. Uh, the, the Spirit, like I mentioned, is a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. How do we know that God will keep the promise that there is a place prepared for us, that when we die, we will go and be with God? Because of the Spirit in our lives. God's not going to leave the deposit here. God has made the deposit and intends on collecting. So this is the first picture that we get, the Holy Spirit coming down. And we will see later on that the Spirit plays an active part in the life of Jesus, just like the Spirit plays an active part in our lives. Next, from heaven, what do we have? A voice. You are my Son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Jesus, I don't think, needed to hear these words. He knew that he was loved by God. Because that's God's nature. But again, here's an example for us. And it's good that we hear these words too. Because when we are invited into baptism, we hear those same words. That we are loved by God. Not because we've done something to earn it or to deserve it or or anything like that. But because that is God's nature to look upon us with love. Just like God looks upon Jesus with love. And one of the things that always motivates me with this is that uh, when I think about why I would want to live like Jesus, why I would want to be obedient to God, it's not because I want to earn God's love. It's because God's love for me is so transformative, so powerful, that I want to live in a way that's worthy of God's love. But I'm also so thankful because I know that I don't always live up to that. And that doesn't mean that God stops loving me. When I fall short, God still loves me. And that is grace. That is good news, isn't it? So here is this picture of Jesus being baptized in the water, heaven opening, the Holy Spirit coming down physically as a dove, and this voice from heaven saying, you are my son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. And by the way, um, remember that whole working part? Jesus This isn't like at the end on the cross when he said, okay, Jesus, you really came through a lot of trials and tribulations. Now I'm pleased with you because you've worked really hard. These accounts are all similar that this is at the beginning of the ministry of Jesus, before he's done all the work that we see in the Gospels. Preceding all this work, what's God's disposition towards Jesus? With you, I am well pleased. There's another part of this picture that I want us to see. One of the most confusing aspects of our Christian faith is is the nature of God. We affirm that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but the Son is not the Father, the Son is not the Spirit, the Spirit is not the Father. That's the idea of the Holy Trinity. It's confusing. It doesn't really make sense as much as we try to make sense of it because it's just how can three be one, but the three are not the same, but they are one. Um, The idea of the Holy Trinity is something that the church came up with to make sense of this biblical image, and it's in other places. But here's one of the verses where we can specifically point to it. Here is God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all present, all interacting. God interacts in community. That's part of the reason also why it's important for the church. It's not just me It's us. We are invited into a community. Uh, God exists in community, and we are invited into that as the people of God. So here we get this picture of what it means to be baptized through the model of Jesus. And this is what I want you to take away from this as we come to the close here. I want you to know that just as Jesus is invited into the presence of God, we are invited into the presence of God. Just as the Holy Spirit comes and descends upon Jesus, 
God longs to send the Holy Spirit in us, fill us with the Spirit so that we can live not by our own strength, but by God's strength in a way that pleases and glorifies God. And finally, I want us to hear that same message, that we have been adopted to sonship in Christ. And so just as God the Father says to Jesus the Son, you are my son whom I love, with you I am well pleased, that as the people of God who have been adopted by our God, who can call God Father in Jesus, brother, that those words can be extended to us as well, that we have a God who looks upon us with love and who is well pleased in us. Friends, may we hold on to this picture, whether we remember our baptism or not. May we hold on to this picture and remember what it means to be people who have been baptized into the community of believers. Amen. Friends, I want to invite you now to join with me as we affirm our faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. Sisters and brothers, what is it that we believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into Hades. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I'd like to invite the ushers to come forward as we prepare to present God with our tithes, our gifts, and our offerings this morning. And as, we, as they are coming forward, let us remember that we have a God who has given to us generously many gifts. And let us give to God with generous hearts. <laughs> Please stand as we sing the doxology. Father, we ask that you would take these, our tithes, our gifts, our offerings to you, to you, and use them alongside our life, 
to the work that you have called us to of proclaiming your good news. Thank you, Lord, for your generosity to us. We praise you and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please join now in our closing hymn, number 201, He is Born. may we go from here remembering that we belong to the people of God, invited in by Jesus, adopted as God's children. Let us give thanks and praise to God for making us part of his people. Receive now the blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen.